So we're going to jump into, uh, and this is a timer, so it's a two-minute timer. And we got a two-minute timer because this is a 15-point sermon. And we're going through the whole book of Joshua. So we're going to go through the whole book of Joshua. And Cheryl and I are going to tag team. And so she's got two minutes. I got two minutes. She got two minutes. I got two minutes. And so that means we're going to keep this sermon pretty close to 40 minutes or so. Because 15 points is 30 30 minutes. And then we got 10 minutes for overages. (laughs) His overages, just saying. No, it's just uh, we got to do an introduction, which we're going to start pretty soon. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so Joshua, we're starting in the book of Joshua. Did you have a couple of interesting facts about Joshua? I'm going to do that at the end. You're going to do that at the end? Really? Yes. Okay, Mm -hmm. all right. Glad you missed rehearsal. All right. So Joshua, we're in Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses, wherever you set foot, you will be on the land that I have given to you. So wherever you put your foot, and that interesting word, that word is a word kof, and that word means to take. So literally, whatever you take, I've given you. Whatever you take, whatever you take, I have given you. Amen? So, man, it's time. It's time to stop wandering around the wilderness. It's time to transition into the full promise of God. Yes! Thought that thought that was exciting. Joshua 5, 12, it says, Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Now, that's good, right? Because in the wilderness, you know, God, angel food cake every day, that was nice, and water from the rock, and that was all nice. But you know what? Isn't it great when you step from that, that, that hopeless receiving mode, that, that, that God help me mode, to where you step into a realm where you partner with God in digging wells and sowing seeds, mm-hmm. in seeing and working miracles yourself, and seeing the land produce for you, and seeing the promise of God come into manifestation. So here's the mindset you need for a transition. You ready? When you step into your inheritance, you have a new possession mindset. You go from a slavery to a landowner. You go from a traveler to a conqueror. You go from a taker to a giver. You go from collecting stuff to partnering in the miraculous. You go from waiting for a miracle to performing miracles. You got to step into that. You go from helpless to fruitful, and you go from dreams to reality, and you become a child who walks in their inheritance for real and on purpose. So that's what it's all about. So we got 50 points about observations about this transition that you can apply to your life. Are you ready? All right, so here's some observations we've made, and uh, they're all processional observations, but number one, number one is association. First thing we had in Joshua 1.1, who was Joshua? Who was this leader? Who was this guy? Oh, I'm on the clock. Who was this guy? This is Joshua, the son of Nun. He was Moses' minister. He was the servant of Moses. This is the guy who served Moses. When Moses went up into the presence of God, when Moses was in the mountain, when he was there, Joshua was there. When he went out to the tent of meeting he spoke face to face with God Joshua was there Joshua was somebody who was mentored by Moses somebody who served Moses somebody who had all those experiences that Moses had he had a first hand he had a he had a very close association with what it was to experience that level of an interaction with God and you know what if you're going to walk into the fullness of your inheritance you need an association you need an association with God you need a first hand association with him you need to have a a revelation of the fullness of the Holy Ghost in your life. In uh, Mark chapter 3, 13 and 14, it says, Jesus, he prayed, it says, and then he went and he, he found 12 people and he appointed them, and it says he appointed them that they would be with him. That's the first thing that happened was they would be with him because so much is learned because of a relationship. So much is learned because of an association. And you got the spirit of truth who comes in you and crossing over into the fullness of God, walking in the promise, you're full inheritance. Inheritance, that's where you understand and you got a full revelation of your association with the third person of Trinity. The Holy Ghost is leading you fully into all of this. And sometimes you need other relationships. If your marriage stinks, find somebody whose marriage who doesn't stink. If you're a financial mess, talk to someone who's not a financial mess. Get yourself in relationship. If you don't get the grace of God, find somebody who does. So don't seek your own level. Don't, don't hang out with just the same crowd all the time that always think the way you do. Go deeper in your revelation of God. Go deeper in your revelation of things. My turn. Okay, you're going to push the button for me? Oh, okay. 
All right, so we've got association. The next point is elimination. I, and I told Pastor Carl I didn't really like this word because it always makes me think of potties and toilets. Anyways, we have elimination. And uh, Joshua 1-2 says, Moses, my servant, is dead. And so God was challenging Moses to eliminate some of the uh, failures and successes from past leadership. But I don't know about you. If I had to step into Moses' shoe, that would be a little bit daunting. True. I would be remembering Aaron's rod that butted to stop a plague. I'd be remembering Korah's rebellion where everybody got swallowed. I'd be remembering the fact that Moses was forbidden from going into the promised land because he didn't do exactly what God said. So I would be nervous about that. I'd have to eliminate those kind of things. But I think a transition, it's a time of transition. It's a time of a new dispensation for Joshua. It's a time of change and passage and adaptation and evolution for even him himself. He's no longer the servant, but he has to become the leader. And now he has to lead these people through a different dispensation in a different time. So when I think about transitions like that, I'm reminded of the scripture in Isaiah chapter 6 where it says that king, on the year that King Uzziah died, I was in the presence of the Lord. This is Isaiah talking. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and then the robe his hem, the hem of his robe filled the temple. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And I said, here am I, send me. When we meet, move forward, we need to leave the past behind. But before we leave the past behind, we need to see the Lord, we need to hear the Lord, and we need to respond to the Lord. And that's the same as Joshua. He had to wait on God, he had to hear the Lord, he had to respond to the Lord, he had to do what God said. Moving forward with God is leaving the past behind. It's possessing your present and it's seeing your future. Boom. Oh. That, but it mics are expensive. <laughs> that was good. So I went over, so that's one nothing for me. Okay, so is that how it works? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, Paul said this. He said, I he said forgetting. this. He said, I have achieved, I have, not that I've achieved, but I focused on one thing, forgetting what one is thing. past and looking forward to what and is And that's a good point about Isaiah because you know what? Sometimes you won't see your future because you're focusing on the king. You're focusing on something in your life. And that's that, what was Moses yeah. was doing. He was probably commiserating a bit. They, they Joshua, mourned thinking about Joshua. Moses. That's why he's, Moses is dead. I mean, I think he knew he was dead. 30 years of mourning. It's time to move days. on. It's time to move on. It's time for you. It's your time. And I think that's what Isaiah had to see that, you know, Uzziah is dead. Quit mourning mm-hmm. about that. And you know what? Sometimes for you to step into your future, your king's got to die. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you've propped something up in your life or something in your life that that's that's your source of everything. Sometimes to move to another level, you got to let that go. You and know, you even gotta, in situations like that, you can see God, you can yeah. hear God, and it will create in you a response to but God. But sometimes you got to forget the good, you got to forget the bad, you got to let it go. You got to let the past be the past. Lose your regrets, stop all that stuff. Come on, it's time to step into okay, your Okay, Pastor Carl, next right. thing. Point number three, amen. So saturation, say saturation. Saturation. All right, Joshua 1, 5, so as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. He says, and that's good. Don't you think that's comforting? Just like I was with Moses. And he knew, he knew the relationship that Moses had with God. He said, just like the same quality, the same relationship Moses had, that's what you're going to have with me. I'm going to be there for you. You're going to experience me. And I think that's really, really good for Joshua. I know Joshua. Joshua says in Exodus 33, 11, it says that when Moses went into the tent, he talked to God and he got a revelation of what to do. He got direction from the Lord. And see, Moses was told, okay, go do something. He left the presence of God to do something. But Joshua, he was face down, just snot faced in the presence of God going, this is really good stuff. And Moses just left him there. So there were times that Joshua just soaked. He just saturated. He got pickled in the presence of God and he knew his presence and he enjoyed the presence of God. He got saturated in the goodness of God, the love of God, the joy of God, the nature of God, the character of God. He got completely saturated in the revelation of who God was. And as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. John chapter 14, 17, and 18. He, the Holy Spirit, he will lead you into all truth, but you know him because he lives with you now, but later he will be in you. And Jesus is talking about the Holy Ghost is going to take up his fixed residence inside of you. You're not an orphan. You're not helpless. You're not alone. The Holy Spirit has come. And and if you're in a broken situation, he is there right now. I love what Salima said. You got God on your side right now. Jesus manifesting in every circumstance and situation. Wow. That's impressive, Pastor Carl. Okay, so we've got association, we've got elimination, and we've got saturation. And the next thing is meditation. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, uh, the Lord commanded Joshua, study this book of instruction continually. Medi- 
dictate on it day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And so meditation is the word haga. It's a verb. It's an act, it's action. So it's not a passive thing that we do in meditation. It's actually an active thing that we do in meditation. It means to, I was going to say sputter. It means to mutter, to speak to oneself. He's trying to distract me. To devise, a, to ponder, you and hugger. to imagine. And um, so when you think about meditation, it's talking to yourself and it's imagining yourself doing something. And it's also, there's another term that, or another thing that it describes it like a lion who growls over his prey. Mm -hmm. So here's Joshua. He's contemplating going into the promised land. And like a lion growling over his prey, pray. He's, he's muttering. He's, he's saying things to himself. He's getting, he's connecting with God and he's imagining himself taking over the land and taking the people into the land. So what are we to meditate on the word? And so Joshua had the book of the law, but we also have the book of the law and we have the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us, who speaks the rhema word of God. The word says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, proceeds from the, the mouth, mouth of God. God. And that's a rhema word. So you and I as believers, we're doubly blessed. We have the low Logos written down, but we also have the rhema of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit. So the word of God is powerful on the inside of us. And Romans 10.17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. Rhema of God. So meditating will cause you to break out and to attack and fall upon prosperity. Wow, that was good. So we got association, elimination, saturation, and meditation, which leads us to one of my favorite words, prognostication. I don't know where he came up with these words. That's a great word, Progno What's the prognosis? So they have to figure out what the prognosis is, right? Hey, you got to analyze things. You got to study. You got to develop a strategy. What is the prognosis? Joshua 2, 1, go and view the land, especially Jericho. Joshua 6, 2, he said, see, I have given you Jericho into your hand. You had to know the prognosis. Ra'ah, ra'ah is the, to perceive, to cause, to see. So he told you, I want you to see. And before you even take hold of something, I want you to understand that the prognosis, you get the prognosis ahead of time. Here's the prognosis. You win. Here's the prognosis, victory. Here's the prognosis, healing. Here's the prognosis, God wants to prosper you. Here's the prognosis, it's a good, good land that the Lord is giving you. And he wants you to see that. See, before they even went to Jericho, before they even attempted to take Jericho, God said, I want you to see before you even get there that I have given you Jericho. And so you're condemned to a life of victory every single day. That's the prognosis. When they went and did the prognosis, two primary results of the the recon, the recon. Number one, it'll give you confidence. When you know it's good and when you know what you see is wonderful, yeah. that gives you confidence to go and appropriate it. Yeah. When you know that God says, you see all that? You see those lands, those cities, those things, those wells, those vineyards that you didn't do anything for? I have given you that land. And that gives you confidence to go in and approach it. But the second thing that happened was they ran into people. And what they heard in the land was they heard that the people are already terrified. The people are already concerned about us. The people are already tremoring. The Victory is already won. And they also had compassion because they ran into this woman. I mean, she hid them in a brothel, but they realized that she said, whoever you are, your God, I want your God to be my God. And they realized that these people, we can have compassion because these people, they need the same good God that we have. So it's going to give you confidence, but it's going to give you compassion for the loss that you're going out there to see that people need Jesus. <laughs> Very good, very good. And wow. I just wonder sometimes if more people had realized, nope, this isn't my turn yet, had realized that they could appeal to the compassion of God and the yes. goodness of God. If Rahab appropriated that. Rahab. Want, you she, know, was, she was David's great, great grandma. But how many others could she have appropriated was Jesus, the great, compassion great, great, of God? She was in the line of Christ. Somebody in that land, somebody who was seeking yeah. deliverance. The most powerful people in the world are probably still in the harvest and we need to get them out. True. All right. All right. Sorry. Sorry. I interrupted you. All right. Time. So we have uh, association, meditation, saturation, uh, prognostication, and we also have incubation. In Joshua 3, verse 1 and 2, after he spent this time with the Lord, he's been commanded by the Lord to be strong and be courageous. And it says that, um, and then the Lord said, you're going to go over and go through the river. And Joshua 3, verse 1 to 2 says, and Joshua lodged there for three days before passing over. Lodge means to rest, to tarry, 
to remain in a state, a state of waiting on God and listening. And it wasn't a state of inactivity, but it still was a state of waiting. And I, I would imagine that meditation and incubation go closely, are closely related together. And as you meditate and you, you see God and and you hear God and you get direction from God, you need to incubate that because you don't want to kind of go off with half-baked ideas. So Joshua incubated. He, he stayed. He lodged. He remained in a place of openness to God and listening for God. The word doesn't tell us that God gave him specific strategy, but if God told him everything else, I would imagine God said to Joshua, you know, tell the people that you have to wait for the priest to go into the river. They're going to go into the middle. I want you to go a half a mile behind them and everybody purify themselves. Gather 12 stones. Set up yeah, these up the, so the pillars in the middle and everything yeah. else. So incubation is a time where you can receive more specific direction from the Lord. And so we don't want to act on half-baked ideas. We want to get our plans, make our plans, and soak our plans. Isaiah 64 verse 4 says, God acts for the one who waits for him. Amen. That was good stuff right there. That was good. I had like a I could redeem some of that time. Nope. Oh, I can't, okay, I can't start it. All right, don't start it. I'm not going to start it then. Okay, articulation. <laughs> Articulation, Joshua 3, 9 to 10, come near. Come near, he brought all the folks forward. Come on, I want you all to understand. I want you to all get the vision that the Lord has given us. I want you to all come near and hear the words of the Lord our God. And by this you shall know, by this you shall know, by this you shall know. We want to get the heart of God, the revelation of God. We want to get a revelation through the articulation of who he is. And you got to have vision. In Habakkuk 2, 2, it says, write the vision down and make it clear. And it talks about so people, when they're running, they can see the clarity of it. Make it so clear that if a person was running with that vision, that it's so clear that even while they're running, they can see the clarity of the vision. So there's understanding of that vision. Even with, even with incredible activity, the vision is still clear and understandable. So what is the vision? I tell you, you got to have the vision. And vision's important. One of Proverbs chapter 29, I think verse 18, it says, without a vision, people perish. Without a vision, you wonder, why am I hanging around here? That's without a vision, strength. you kind of go, what's the point? And you see, vision is what attaches you. Vision is what connects you. Vision was, is what gives you passion to do something. So one translation says, without a harness, people cast off restraint. It says, vision can be considered even a harness. So uh, you get harnessed with the purpose when you understand the vision. It's like if we had, you know, a whole bunch of uh, horses in a field, all those horses by themselves, there's a lot of horsepower, but it's not harnessed. But when you get the horses and you harness them, you hook them up like the, the Budweiser Clydesdales, I mean, they can pull a massive load when you get harnessed with the purpose of God, that's when purpose comes on you, and that's when you start to manifest what God's called you to do. So it's very, very important to have purpose. We got vision around here, even at Impact Church. There's things we're doing. There's things happening right now that, that I don't want to share half-baked stuff, but there's a lot of really good stuff happening right now with lands and properties and, and things and assignments in Nova Scotia. We got another church in Nova Scotia that would like to align with us. We got another, another church here in Ontario that we're starting to work with now. There's a bunch of things going on and it's going to unfold. It's going to unfold. I see churches all the way down this 401 corridor all the way. Wow. Is Gracie keeping score today? <laughs> but one thing I do want to say, just just in, in our staff meeting, we added 18 people to our address list just this week. I was, that's so exciting. We added 18 people to our list. That means people that have become consistent uh, people attending, they become consistent givers, and they're plugging into an aspect of ministry. That was 18 people, but we made a dedication. Our staff, we've been praying together and texting each other every day. We're praying for 10 new families by July 1st, 10 new families. I had somebody last night saying, that's too small a number. I said, well, pray with us then. Go high or go bigger, but I want to tangibly, I want to check that box that on July 1st, there's 10 new <laughs> members here. I took a lot of your time there. I'm it's, sorry it's about the that, kids going I'll pee. press start. All right, so my next point is activation. Activation means to make something happen. Joshua 3, verse 15 to 16 says, The Jordan was overflowing its banks, but as soon as the feet of the priests were, who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began to back up a great distance all the way to a town called Adam. I love this picture. I love that God causes you to go into a new destiny, a new dispensation, not in a time of drought, but in a time of overflowing, of harvest and the river banks overflowing. And I love that God doesn't take us to a place of drought, but he takes us to a place of prosperity. I, um, I love this thing because, you know, they, these priests who were all dressed up in their garb, and I don't know if you've ever tried to cross a river or a creek when it's flowing and it's it's running and your feet get stuck in rocks and everything, but these priests had to step out into that river 
in all of their priestly garb. They had to carry the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. But you know what? As soon as they stepped into the river, the river stopped flowing. And it's, uh, uh, anything from that point went all the way to the Dead Sea. And anything beyond that point backed up all, all the, the way, way to, to Adam. Adam. And so when I think about activation, I think our action makes God's word operative in our lives. Now, I love that all the way back to Adam, though, because that means for me when, you know, if if uh, there's only one time a year that there's a flood at the Jordan, and, and that's during this season. And they could have said, Lord, tell you what, let's wait another, another month or so, because in a month it's only going to be a creek, and we can just step over it. Mm -hmm. But see, God wants you to realize that just like getting out of Egypt was a miracle, stepping into your destiny is a miracle. Mm -hmm. Stepping into your destiny isn't a principle. Stepping into your destiny isn't good behavior. Stepping into your destiny is stepping into a realm of the miraculous. Mm -hmm. And it was a miracle to get you out, and I want it to be at flood stage because I want you to see it's a miracle that gets you in. Yeah. And you're called to a life of the miraculous, yeah. and they went across in flood stage. And the waters went all the way back to Adam. That means all the way back through your line, all the way back through every generation. I am cleansing that whole thing so that you're going to walk now in newness of life and fresh of life and none of that junk is going to follow you into your destiny can i get an amen for that one it's a good thing i give him some more time you did give i me love some this more time. That, mo that the people exited slavery through water and they entered into their destiny through water amen, amen. miraculous yeah. stuff you ready so we got number nine is identification now what's interesting is that massive miracle to get you into the new land right you're in the promise of god whoa let's go attack yeah but no again it was wait Again, we entered into this. It was a miracle. But again, we're commanded to wait. And there they were. It says, at that time, the Lord told Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise this new generation, the second generation of Israelites. So Joshua made flint knives. Say knives. Thank God it was nice because we had a, a hunt, over hundreds of thousands of circumcisions that day. I couldn't imagine Moses or, or Joshua having to do that all himself. Could you? I'm sure he had help. Anyways. Anyways I'm sure he had help. It's, yes, it is. Yeah. Anyway, so Joshua made Flint and I circumcised the entire male population of Israel because none of them had been circumcised. After, after, you know, they failed to go in, after that, nobody in that 40 years in the wilderness was circumcised and they never practiced Passover. They had 40 years of just miserable drought and just awful stuff stuff. Now for the first time they came in, for the first time now every male had to be circumcised and they did the Passover for the first time. So that whole thing, and it's at a place called uh, Gebeath Haraloth, which I think, I don't know, it's Gilgal. It's a place called to roll away or to peel back or to roll away, to push back, to move once and for all. We're taking all the past. We're taking it all. We're being set apart to a new place in life. And, and that place is called, it means a mountain of foreskins. That's what it means. <laughs> interesting place a mountain of foreskins so let me just quickly look why circumcision why why this sign why this thing of circumcision first of all because it cuts the root of your identity it tells you who you are and you're going to enter into the promise of God you got to know who you are it cuts the root of your identity you are a child of God it's the first identity that you have is is it a boy is it a girl well here it is you're a child of God that's the identifying thing second thing is privacy right in the private place nothing's hidden from God and the third thing is creativity nothing divine of, of origin is going to come out of you because you have to have the touch of God for anything powerful and divine to come out of your life. So you need the circumcision for that to happen. I wow. gave you extra space. Wow. All right. Point number 10, yeah. exaltation. Another word for exaltation is adulation. It means admiration, respect, lionization, lionizing, veneration, devotion, adoration, honor, homage, a person. Joshua 3 verse 7 says this, the Lord said when they were crossing the Jordan, today I will make you a great leader in all of their eyes. Joshua 4 14, on that day the Lord exalted him in the sight of Israel and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of their life. Joshua 6 verse 27 says, so the Lord was with Joshua and his reputation spread throughout the land. In Joshua 10 verse 4 we have King Adonai Zedek, one of the five kings that wanted to attack uh, Gibeah. Gibeon. The Gibeonites, yeah. Gibeonites. And he said, you know, we need to attack this city. They're a royal city. They're a big city because jo they have made a pact of peace with Joshua. So Joshua's name was exalted among his own people, but Joshua's name had begun to be exalted among the nations. And why does God make you big? Because he makes himself big when he makes us big. Yeah. Amen. You know, the blessing of Abraham, one of the things about the blessing of Abraham, he says, I'm going to make you famous. I thought that was really interesting, don't you? Part of the blessing of Abraham is to make you famous. And I, I, I know this, you know what? The Holy Ghost makes you look like a genius. 
the Holy, the Holy Ghost can take anybody and make them look really smart. And you know, the Holy Ghost, his presence in your life is always going to exalt you and bless you. It would have looked so weird, their first strategy, you know, going to Jericho, six marching days around, quiet, bah, seven, bah, bah, bah. march around yeah. seven days, blow a horn. And, and to us, that would seem absurd. Yeah. Um, but God may, God exalted Joshua he exalted among his, his own name. people. He honored and the Lord. The he obeyed yeah. that funny strategy and you know god showed himself mighty in that place and and when god shows himself mighty in your life you know what you and god get elevated in a situation yeah. you know it causes adoration causes adoration absolutely all right, all right that means i'm moving on to presumption presumption say presumption presumption now we're in the land we're doing all that we talked about this at offering time but jericho they sought god's plan jericho he took time he went and he, he stood before the lord and the man with the sword came he said i'm not here to pick sides i'm here to tell you here's how you do life I'm not here to take your side. I'm here to tell you that I want to take over and I want you to follow hard after me. So there, they got a clear prescription. They had clear understanding of how to move ahead. But then here in Joshua 7, verse 3, they say there's no need for everybody to go. They decided instead of talking to God about how do we move forward from here, they thought, you know what? That was amazing. We took Jericho, but that's just a little town. Let's not bother everybody. Now, if you don't consult God in the next step of your strategy, you're assuming that I can do this in my own strength. Or that it's going to be the same. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't assume any situation that I'll do it just like I did before. Remember, remember Samson? Samson got up and shook himself, and he said, I'll get up and I'll, I'll, I'll take out all these Israelites like I did before, and he didn't realize that the Spirit had left him. You know, you, you can't be presumptuous with God. You got to, every day of your life, be totally submitted to being under the control of the Holy Spirit. Way too often, sometimes, I don't know with me, I'm a bit of an activator sometimes. I'm like, I'm not going to bother you today, God. I can get through this day all on my own. But you know what? I want to be simple enough and humble enough to say, this day, Lord, I want to be led by you. This day, Lord, I want to be led by your eye. This day, I want to be led by that personal relationship with you. So we can't allow the presumption to enter in. The anatomy of a contradiction, presumption. They lost the victory there. They they had a, they, a little town chased them and there was a breakdown now the anatomy is god's def your defeat is not god's defeat your defeat is not god and often we think because we got defeated then then god was defeated your defeat's not god's defeat sometimes there's a contradiction there because we really never sought the lord and so we have to understand sometimes what happens in that place of contradiction and we got to understand that that's not it oftentimes we blame god for our disconnects or others or all these other things but sometimes there may be an issue going on that you don't know about but if you seek him as they did god showed them the problem they dealt with it and they moved on because the promise of god will always be fulfilled in your life. Pastor Carl, I think that's four. Is that four beeps? Yeah. Man, yeah. who's counting? All right, after presumption calls frustration. And so frustration is the feeling of being upset or annoyed as a result of something being unable to change or the result of you being True. unable to it achieve is annoying. something. Uh, Joyce Meyer says this, frustration is a sign I'm acting independently of God. And that's precisely what happened to the people of Israel. They acted independently of God. They did not consult God. They just assumed or presumed that it would be the same way. Joshua 6 verse 7 or 7 verse 6 and verse 10 and 11 says, Then Joshua tore his clothes fell on the earth and covered his face before the ark of the Lord. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face? Israel is sin. This is what frustration looks like. It's tearing your clothes. It's putting ashes on your face. It's actual public mourning. And I don't know about you, but I've been frustrated sometimes. And I'm sure I've looked like Joshua that, I, you know, sad and frumpy and everything is. Anyways, so the best place and the best thing that Joshua did in that moment of frustration is he did, he did, what are you doing? I didn't start it. So. Oh, well, this is a long one. Anyway, so he, uh, he was frustrated. He demonstrated frustration. He didn't kind of bottle it all up, but he went to the right place. He went to the presence of the Lord and fell on his face in front of the ark in the presence of the Lord. When you get frustrated, you need to do the same thing. You need to go to the bam, presence of the bam, Lord, bam. and you need to... Be before God and get a new strategy and figure out what, what's going on. And Joshua wasn't totally blameless. He was presumption. He, did, he didn't consult God when they went up to Ai. But you know what? What about the rest of the people who were just following Joshua's commands? Yeah. And they all suffered because of one person's stupidity. Trouble. Or yeah. because Joshua and the leaders didn't presumed that they could yeah. do the same thing. You know, sometimes there are things in your life that happen You're that have nothing to nothing do with, to do you, with that you that you are out of control of. And you can be frustrated. Where did this... I think about Hezekiah when he... It says 
says in um, Isaiah that Hezekiah was a good king and had done everything right, and then Sennacherib brought his army against him. Yeah. It's like, what the heck, what God? What's wrong? going What's on? With this? But you know what? In a place of frustration, even if there are people responsible, or even if you're responsible, come on, don't don't walk around forever and right. mourning in sackcloth come and on. ashes. You need to go to the presence of so. God. You need Take to fall before the ark of God. Yeah, and you need to get a strategy and figure out what's going on. Sometimes losing the battle, you find new ways to win the war. That was Donald Trump. That was Donald Trump. Yep. Good for you. Wow. Okay, pause. All right, good. I'm doing really good with the well, time. Well, actually, no, I think you were way over that time. How many think she was probably way over but on I that I still one? had 29 seconds. Thank you. Well, that's because I started it like a minute late. Oh, whatever. Okay, anyway, authentication. Authentication. How many are actually getting something out of this so far? How many are at least somewhat entertained? <laughs> All right, authentication. We did this last night because we were, wanted to stop by seven to do the worship thing. So when I told Cheryl I had a 15-point sermon, she said the only way to stop you is to put a timer on you. And we thought it was fun last night, so we it did it again today. running out of time, so Oh, sorry. Open. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> Authentication, Joshua 9, 14 and 15. So the Israelites examined their food and they did not, listen to this, they examined their food, but they did not consult the Lord. Oh, oh my, my goodness. Right after Ahab. Right after all that, again, here they are. It says, but they did not consult the Lord. They examined their food, but they did not consult the Lord. Then Joshua made a peace treaty with them and guaranteed their safety. And the leaders of the community ratified their agreement with a binding oath. Now, here's an oath. Here's what you do when there's a covenant. And making a covenant means my enemies are your enemies, my needs are your needs, my problems are your problems, and my resources are your resources. And when you honor who you are in Christ, even when when you are mistreated, you most manifest your true identity as a child of God. Amen, that's true. Let me read that again. When you honor who you are in Christ, even when you're mistreated, that is when you most manifest your true identity as a child of God. See, here they were. These people lied to us. These people tricked us into a covenant. And yet when their enemies came to attack them, the Gibeonites said, Hey, we got a problem. I got five kings coming to kill us. I don't know. If I was Israel, I would have said, you deserve it, you filthy wretches. You lied to us anyways. No, you wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. But you know what? Even if, even if you've been mistreated in a situation or a personal experience, you know what? You have a covenant with God, and you have a responsibility to love every single person around you. And if you take it in your own hands that you get to pick and choose who you love and don't love, you're not manifesting your true identity as a child of God. Everyone, you're in debt to love everyone. And when you honor people who are even, it says that you're more blessed, you are most blessed even when people lie about you, falsely use you, and all that, that's when you really manifest that you're a son of God and you authenticate who you are in Christ. You know, Jesus himself, he, he suffered and died. He was mistreated and abused. And yeah. He said, Father, forgive well, that's them. That's it. What do you say? Father, Father forgive, forgive them. them. They don't know what they're That's doing. right. Okay, so the next thing is demonstration. Demonstration is the act of showing that something exists or is true by giving proof or evidence. The proving that God is on our side. It says, honoring the covenant led to displacing five kingdoms. So five kings and their armies came out to attack Gibeon. And Joshua came to their aid. And the five kings were the king of Jerusalem, which means peace, the king of Hebron, which means union, the king of Algon, which means authority. Uh, Jarmuth. No, Jarmoth means authority, High Algon places. means uh, Fatness, anointing. anointing. Sorry. And Lachish means invisible. It does mean invincible. Yeah. <laughs> These are the distinguishing features that belong to us. Come on. I have peace. Yeah. I have union. I have authority. I have an anointing, and we are invincible. invincible. Amen. And so God wants to demonstrate that we belong to Him, and we ne need to demonstrate God as well. Uh, mo <clears throat> Sorry. Exodus 33, verse 15 to 16 says this Moses said to the Lord, If your present doesn't go with me, do not carry us up from here. For by what shall it be known that I and your people have favor in your sight? It is, not, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinguished, I and your people, from all other people on the face of the earth? God wants to distinguish us among the peoples of the earth. And he does this by showing up big and showing up strong in our, in our, on our behalf. And he gives us peace. He gives us union. He gives us authority and anointing and invincibility. Those are ours. And those are things that Come belong on. to us. And God allows us to participate right. in victory so that we, we demonstrate that God is on our side. Amen. Uh, Isaiah 26. 
Oh, I can say it really fast. Verse 12 to 14 says, The former tyrant masters are dead. They shall not live any long or reappear. They are powerless ghosts. They shall not rise and come back. Therefore you have visited and made an end of them and caused every memory of them and every trace of their supremacy to perish. That's what God does for us. I That's love how he that distinguishes verse. himself. I love that verse. That's how he distinguishes us. Amen? Oh, it's so good. All right, Pastor Carl. Even the memory of them will be gone. They are so far gone that even I'm going to take it out of your memory. It's going to cease to exist. Absolute restoration. You can say, sun, stand still. Your victory is absolutely guaranteed. Man. I was done before that, people. Okay, way. sorry Wait, about I that. just want to say something. I When I think about that, you know, you think about a lot of things that have happened in your life, and many of us have experienced trauma and a devastating things in our life and it's amazing how in time and, and journeying with God and meditating on God and meditating with God and everything else that God could cause those memories that used to cause incredible pain just to be memories Come that on. have no place in your life no anymore. Place. Amen? Amen. And Amen. they were still an enemy right. of your life but they are not an enemy of my yeah. present nor my future. Done. Dead. No longer to go. reappear. Powerless ghosts that shall not rise and come back. Amen. Say right. that, say that, say that to those experiences that keep you up at night. Say that. Amen. Man. All right, Pastor Carl, next one. Number 15, say 15. 15. Woo, and Woo. there's only 35, so we're getting close. <laughs> This is one of my favorite guys in, is Caleb. I love Caleb because Caleb was a Kenizzite, which means he wasn't even originally an Israelite. He was somebody who chose to be an Israelite. Caleb chose, and his name means dog. Woof, woof. Here was a dog who chose to be an Israelite and became a leader in that tribe. Was, I mean, was sent out. And this Kenizzite, who wasn't even an Israelite, he was one of only two people of that generation that actually got to enter into the land. But Caleb, when they got in the land, he said, Joshua, this is it. I've been waiting for this day for 40 years. I couldn't wait for all those miserable people to die. But now it's time. I, don't give me my inheritance. Don't give it to me. I'm going to take that high place. I'm going to take Hebron. I'm going to take intimacy. I'm going to take the place of union. It's mine. I saw it. I want it. And I'm taking it now. I love that. You know what? It's time to substantiate the promises of God in your life. It's time to substantiate your identity. It's time to lay a hold of substantiation. So in Hebrews chapter 1, or Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the Darby translation of the New Testament says, Now faith is the substantiating of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's the substantiating. Faith is how you substantiate. The word substantiate means to make it real or concrete, to give reality to the substance. Faith is how you substantiate things. And you got to release your faith. Are you who he says you are? Yes, I am. You got to release your faith for that. You got to lay hold of that. You got to go and you got to pursue that. Embrace your inheritance absolutely and totally for real. You got to release your faith and say, come on, it's mine. I'm taking it now. Amen. Very good, Pastor Carl. <laughs> Yes. So before Pastor Carl goes on to his last couple of slides, I just want to go over a couple of things about how Joshua is a type of Jesus. Because all through the Old Testament, we're trying to find Jesus in the Old Testament when it looks so muddy by so many crazy things. So how is Joshua a type of Christ? He, he had a divine appointment and a divine destiny. You know that we know that Jesus came at just the right time to die for our sins. He had a divine appointment and a divine destiny on our behalf. And he was to express the very image of God. Hebrews 1 verse 1 and 2 says, In the past, God tried to speak to our forefathers, but in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, who is the exact express image of him. That's Jesus' divine appointment. And Joshua, in the same way, was demonstrating the goodness of God and the provision of God. There's a glorious uh, component to the name. Joshua and Jesus have the same, same comprehensive name, name. Same name, the same comprehensive meeting. The Joshua. former uh, is Yeshua. Hebrew, Joshua, Yeshua, and the latter is the Greek, Jesus, but it means Savior. Yes. Jo Joshua, Savior, Jesus is our Savior. As a servant, Joshua was, was a servant of Moses, and he was the successor of Moses. As Joshua succeeded Moses, so Jesus and the gospel succeeds the Mosaic law, and is superior to the law. The gospel is superior Amen. to the law, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth has come through Jesus, and Jesus is a succession to the law 
that was given through Amen. Moses. Amen? Amen. Joshua was, was a commander and the leader of the people. And Jesus represents our commander and our leader. He went before us. He suffered and died before mm -hmm. us. He took on humanity. King of and, kings. Yeah, king of kings. He'd suffered and died on the cross, been exalted for all of his people. And he, we now know him as our captain and our leader. It says, um, for, for the glory set before him, he endured the cross. And he did that to bring many sons to glory. So he captain of our glory in the same way that Joshua was the captain and the leader. Joshua conducted the people through the Jordan. It was the river Jordan that God publicly manifested who Joshua was, and it was at the same river that God magnified Jesus and set him apart and said, today this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the Jordan is a river as an emblem of death. As Joshua crossed the people through the river Jordan and death, so Jesus takes us from death unto life. Amen. Jesus overthrew, or Joshua overthrew the walls of Jericho. And you know what's crazy? It seemed like insignificant and a weak strategy, but God conquered that city. And you know what? Jesus came and says it was foolishness to the, um, to the uh, Greek and a stumbling block to the Jews. Jew. But you know, Jesus came, he took on frail humanity, and it looks weak and insignificant, but he... he he won a great victory through us. And just like Joshua overthrew the walls of Jericho through an, a crazy uh, plan, it was a crazy plan and scandalous plan of God to send Jesus yeah. in, the, in the form of flesh for us. Yeah. Joshua was conqueror. Jesus is our conqueror. Amen. It's good, Amen. good. So just summarize the book. You got these passages right here. Here it is. Right here. It's coming up right now. Joshua 21, 45. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Isn't that good? That good? Got, got one more verse for you. A couple more. Here we go. Boom. Joshua 24, 31. The people of Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him. Those who had personally experienced. Say personally experienced. You know, this isn't some philosophy to, you know, kind of a give mental assent to. You've got to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is all about appropriating your inheritance as a child of God. But there is a transition to being a child of God, which is where you accept that Joshua is, Yeshua, Jesus is your Savior and your Lord. It's where you accept him personally, experience him for yourself. Next week, we're going to preach on the whole book of Judges. In Judges 2, 8 to 10, it says, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land, and after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. That's sad, isn't it? It's sad. You know, Moses had Joshua, and sadly, it doesn't look like Joshua had anybody. It's sad that the next generation grew up and they did not know the Lord. The generation that had seen the mighty wonders, the mighty miracles, the generation that came in in power, the generation that possessed everything miraculously, when they died, the next generation was like, what? That's really, really sad. You got to know him. You, you can't have parents that knew him or grandparents that knew him. You got to have a personal revelation of who Jesus is for you. And it works. It's the real deal. I mean, your inheritance is real and we need to appropriate it for real. And we need to make sure that the next generation appropriates it for real too. Come on, stand up. Stand up. Just let's all pray. Everybody's praying. All the believers are praying. We're all praying. Just bow your heads, close your eyes, let's pray. You know, it's fantastic to know that God is. I just love Salima's testimony that you know what? That time she spends with the Lord, there's no better psychotherapist. There's no better financial advisor. There's no better person to give you direction in relationship. There's no better person to give you direction in every issue of your life. It's so good to know that I'm going through life and I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And he's not just with me, he's in me. Lord Jesus, he comes and he takes residence in my life. And it's so beautiful to talk about him. It's so beautiful that even in the Old Testament, you see all the things that God was willing to do for his people. And then when you realize this covenant is a how much more covenant, and we know that God wants to do so much more for you. You know, if you're here today and you got regrets or you got pains, you, you got to take that verse in Isaiah and you got to say, you know what, those tyrants, you're never going to see them again. Those things that have robbed you of your rest, of your peace, God has obliterated that. You need to walk in liberty today. You need to know that who the sun set free is free indeed. No more sleepless nights, no more delays. I'm moving on. No more regrets. I'm moving on in the love of God. But listen, if you're here today and you've, you've never 
once in your life know of a time when you said, uh, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. I, I actually want you to be my Savior. I accept you as the one thing that will reconcile me with the Heavenly Father. And if you've never done that, I want you to do it today. And I'm going to pray with you. But you know right now you're saying, I want in. I want my inheritance. I want to manifest that I am a child of God. I want that. If that's you and you want that, and you've never accepted him before, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. They're going to go one, two, three. And at that, you just put your hand up really high. Are you ready? Here it is. You ready? One, two, three. If that's you, just put your hand up right now. Right now, just put it up really high. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else put your hand up really high? You can still do it really high. Anyone else? All right, you can put your hands down. Wow. Now you put your hand up. We're going to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to hear your voice. I want you to hear your voice. And we're all going to pray with you. So you lift up your voice. And a miracle is going to happen. Because you're going to be born from above. And God's going to take up residence in your life. And you'll never be the same. And it'll be so, so good so good so everybody's gonna pray you pray and everybody prays you ready say Lord Jesus thank you for coming for me thank you for giving yourself for me I confess that you are the way you're the truth and you're the life and so I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior thank you for forgiving my sins thank you for healing me Thank you for restoring me. Now, Holy Spirit, come on in. Testify with my spirit that I am a child of God. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. That was so good right there. That was so good, eh? I just said those are on altar ministry today. Come on up front if you're on altar ministry. Or you do altar ministry. Just to come on up front here and... Just, uh, you know, if you've been here today, you walked in and the whole service has been set up for you. The whole thing's been aligned for you. The songs, everything. You walked in with heaviness. You walked in with concern. You walked in with regret. You walked in. But you know, it's all been fashioned to show you that you have a great inheritance. You have an amazing heritage. You have a great big God who loves you. You know, if you got anything you want to leave at the altar today, if you got anything you say, you know what, I'm not taking that outside with me. I'm going to go in newness of life. I want you to come to the altar. These folks are going to pray with you. If you need healing in your body, you need a word from God, you need rest revelation for a situation there's a place here where you can get prayer and people are ready to help you so the altars are open have you been to the altar lately hey have you been to the altar lately it's a good place to reconnect and let God touch your life let me bless you Heavenly Father thank you for your goodness your kindness thank you for the word of God we pray that we've, we've gone just we sped through the book of Joshua but there's so many good beautiful wonderful things there and we see, Lord, that what you did for them, the way you brought them in, the way you, you took them, and the way you were committed, not one of the words that you spoke over them was not fulfilled, not one, but you performed every word. And I thank you that your word, not one word will fall to the ground, but you'll watch over your word to perform it in our life. So I just pray that as we've heard the good things today, that we'd release our faith to embrace all the good things of God for ourselves. So Father, I bless this house. I bless each and every one right now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I command them blessed in Jesus' precious name. Amen.